are glad uh, that you're here, and we're going to uh, do something maybe just a little bit different, at least it is in, in my mind this morning. For the last uh, three months, essentially, we have been in a, a study of the book of Nehemiah. Uh, you'll not find anything, whether you've been with us before, maybe this is your first time, or you've not been here for every one of those messages. Uh, I would just want you to understand that Nehemiah, Nehemiah is probably the greatest book that you can find, secular or sacred, uh, in terms of the concept of leadership. Now, one of the dangers that we have when we talk about leadership, we'll do one of two things, or, or one of several things. First of all, we'll, we will then take the excuse that that doesn't apply to me because I'm not a leader. And I want you to listen very carefully today because you are a leader. Every single person that is here is a leader. And you have responsibilities and opportunities that I want to tell you, no one, no one can take your place in that. And the good news is, is that God provides us with the skills and the abilities and the opportunities to make a difference. My prayer is, it always is, but particularly today, that we can take this and apply this time of study together individually. This here for you today. Let's pray. Lord, as we come before you today, God, how we thank you for all that you have taught us through this incredible man who made such a difference. It changed the world in which he lived. And he had no background. Uh, he had no uh, particular skills for this that we know of that he had naturally. He had no resources of his own. Uh, he, he didn't have a model to follow. Except the call of God came upon his life. Lord, we have a tendency to look at this scripture today and we look at a man who lived 2,500 years ago in a world that was so different from ours. And Lord, we could fall into the trap of thinking this is just a Bible story. It's just a Bible story and Bible stories are meant to encourage us, not to instruct us. Lord, we've been at this for weeks now. I pray, Lord, that, that we'll not just put this down and not go back to it again, but there'll be these principles that we'll see and we will incorporate into our living. Lord, help us to see that we can make a difference. Help us to see that we should make a difference. And help us to see that we must make a difference. Lord, help us to look around. And in many cases, whether it's in a family or it's in a relationship, uh, it's in the place where we work or where we go to school. Lord, help us to see this in just chance meetings. In the grocery store, at the doctor's office, in the neighborhood. Lord, help us not to be so caught up in ourselves that we don't have any time for anybody else. Lord, help us to see that anything that we do in your name, when we bring a cup of water in Jesus' name, when we teach the truth in Jesus' name, when we provide an example in Jesus' name, when we humble ourselves before others in Jesus' name, it always makes a difference. Help us to see that as leaders, our priorities need to be different. 
Lord, I pray for husbands, for wives, for parents today, for grandparents. For those who are who just are surrounded by friends that they can minister to. Sometimes those that are completely unknown. We so desperately, as individuals, as we can apply these principles to every part of our personal lives, as families, as citizens, co-workers, participants, what, whatever. You know, there, there's not any place where this doesn't apply. This is a moment. This is in a moment of time. It's like we, we cross a line that everything in our life is lined up on one side of that line. Everything, everything social, everything vocational, everything financial, everything physical, everything relational, everything is right there. And Lord, you ask us to step across the line to where you are. where you are the God of resources, the God of wisdom, the God of compassion, the God of clarity. There is no, there is no issue that we face today that you can't help us with. There is no situation where you can't use us. It may not be a lot or it may be a little. But Lord, I just come to you and I just cry out to you in Jesus' name. Oh, Lord, help us to be available. And we're willing to take that next step. Lord, when the, when the people of God come together, there should be a result that hundreds of decisions are made about everything we can possibly imagine. That your people, those who belong to you, would make that commitment to do it your way. It's got to be more than an encouragement, more than a challenge. We pray for a movement of God. Speak to our hearts now, Lord. I pray that you would cause me, I pray for my own life, to look for more opportunities. No, not just walk past them, but to take action on them each and every time. And we pray that we would go home saying, no, we've not just been to a worship service, but we've had an encounter with a living God. And we know, we got directions, we know. Maybe not in every situation, but you bring it to our mind, we know what we should do. And we ask that you'd bless it in Jesus' name, amen. You know, when, you, uh, when I look at this, go back and look at this, Nehemiah was a, was a book and give you just a quick, quick summary. Nehemiah was a man who lived 2,500 years ago. He grew up in the court of uh, King Artaxerxes. He was a slave. And he was the cupbearer to the king. He's a very capable uh, uh, man and had a very responsible position, but still was a slave. 
And he was living a thousand miles from, the, from his home, which was Jerusalem. His family had been brought up in Jerusalem, and they'd been taken slavery, so he'd never been to Jerusalem. He didn't know anything about it. But he knew what Jerusalem represented and what he had grown up, and his parents had brought him up studying the laws of God. And so God called Nehemiah. But at that time, Jerusalem had been in ruins for 140 years. Let me tell you how hard it was to live in Jerusalem. It was so hard to live in Jerusalem, it's like driving through the construction just above Spartanburg on 85, or driving on the construction on the way to Columbia, or driving in the construction on the way to uh, Asheville, which is a mess in all directions for any of you that had been there. And who would have ever thought that going to Atlanta would be the only pleasant thing you could do? And it's horrible. That's what it was like living in Jerusalem. And it was all the time, 140 years. A city was nothing if it didn't have walls. And the walls had been torn down 140 years. They'd lived almost in a slum for 140 years. And God called Nehemiah. God called Nehemiah. Let me tell you something. If God had had, had, had a group of people this, this size and picked out one, Nehemiah probably, the guy that had never been there, he picked the guy that had never been there, that had no experience in this, that had lived as a slave all his life, that had never been trained to be a builder. He picks the most unlikely person, but Nehemiah responds with a sense of call. Now, ladies and gentlemen, we live in a time when there are such great challenges. There are challenges, um, really, uh, the, it, I'd say in three, more than this, but three. There are social or cultural challenges, and those are becoming greater every single day. We see that as we watch the news, and they are challenges that are not questionable in terms of biblical truth. They are, they are absolutely true. Uh, in our culture where we live, several weeks ago, um, our, our legislature did an extremely poor job at handling abortion, and so therefore we are an abortion, as we sit here right now, we're an abortion destination. And all that people talk about is compromise while we kill babies. That's a societal thing. If you saw this week, and, and I hope that you'll understand this, they moved, not, haven't passed it yet, but they overcame the filibuster to pass the Respect for Marriage Act. Okay, This may be the biggest joke in terms of a title for a bill in the history of America. It's horrible, horrible. It is redefining marriage. In case you haven't picked up on that, marriage is between one man and one woman. It is designed and made by God. We're now going to redefine that. And you're going to hear them say, oh, they protected religious liberty. No, they did not. They did not do that. What they, what they did was the closest they did is said, we're going to allow you to go in your church and shut up and never talk about your faith again. It's exactly what happens there. So those are, those are societal uh, challenges that we face. And then there are, of course, relational challenges that we face with the, with the people that we work with, the people that we live with, with our, with our families, with our friends, with people that, that, that disagree with us and how we're to do that in Jesus' name. And then there are personal challenges, just, just things that we are dealing with in our own life, our priorities. What should our priorities be? Uh, our our habits, um, the the actions that we take personally, our our character, and so we have to we have to deal with those things. Now, Nehemiah, God calls you to be a leader in all those areas, and it gets really discouraging because sometimes, and and I have talked to. I'll tell you, I've talked to scores of people, not in in-depth uh, conversations this week, but I would say I would talk, I've talked to literally scores of people just, just at the mention of challenges they face vocationally, challenges they face personally, things that challenges they face in families, uh, in, in, their, in their own lives, 
they're just, it's, it's overwhelming. And when you look at it, you see it's, it's, for, it's for all of us. It's a, it's a huge thing. But here's the great news. When you look at God's Word, when you look at the book of Nehemiah, and we're going to jump through some passages this morning because this is kind of a little bit of a, a summation and a uh, uh, go get a message, okay? And, and when we look at Nehemiah, we see how God prepared him. Now, here's what I want you to understand. This is very important. It is easy for us to look at circumstances. And, uh, and I'm going to do something here a little bit different because when we put this um, stage up, and it's so big, and by the way, we're, we're, uh, as you look in your bulletin, there are just a lot of opportunities in this Christmas season for you to take advantage of that, for you to, um, uh, things that you can be a part of for your family, there are just a lot of great things there that are happening in ways you could minister. By the way, I should have said this earlier. Thank you for everything you did for Operation Christmas Child. We're still loading those boxes, and we had a great time last Sunday evening in our packing party. And uh, they're just boxes have been going in every direction here. And so, thank you for what you did there. And uh, you can be assured of this: that that those kids who opened those boxes, that's probably the only box they've ever had. It's the only thing they've ever been given. So they're going to go through every single item. And when they see that gospel presentation there, they're going to have somebody, if they can't read it, they're going to have somebody read it to them. And Operation Christmas Child does that around the world. Thank you for the difference that you made there. And as we, as we look at this, as I was thinking about it, and just, just thought about it just a few minutes ago, sometimes I never know something until I'm right in the center of it. It is easy to get caught up with what happens in culture. But I'm going to tell you, what we can do, we can have a confidence. I want you to know, we can have a confidence in the Lord God. Uh, I, I just, as I was sitting there and I look at this massive platform, and in some ways that's a good place you go in every direction, but, but we can have a, a confidence. It's like we're talking about something that's separate. It's like we're trying to describe to someone else Mount Everest or uh, something that, that we, we see in terms of uh, beauty in a, in a waterfall or a cliff or a, a landscape or something of beauty, of majesty, of wonder, and it's hard to describe when we can't see it. Well, listen, you can't see it, and I've got a confidence I've got a confidence in the Lord. We serve the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And let me tell you something, folks. What needs to happen around us is that we live in a world that is concerned about what others think and concerned about this group or that group or the, or the Congress or the political parties or a, a certain niche of people because we are so divided in so many areas. We serve the Lord God. The Lord God who is there and who has honored us. Those of us that are followers of Jesus Christ honors us by letting us, no matter how old you are, no matter what your circumstances, no matter what your talent level is, the Lord gives to you an opportunity. So I have a confidence in him. And I have a confidence in you. I have a confidence for many of you. When I look out there and I see that, I have a confidence in, in so many ways what you have done. What you have done and the difference that you have made in the hearts and lives of people. Now, I will tell you, most of us have not filled our potential in that area. We've not. We could do better. Oh, my goodness. I, I, I'm going to tell you something. I don't know. I, I spent a lot of time uh, counting up all the things that I failed at. Boy, did you miss that. Boy, you should have said this. You should have said that. You should have done this. You should have done that. I, I do that a lot. 
But I have a confidence in what many of you have done. That you've made a huge difference in a ministry, in the life of a person. In the prayers that you've prayed, in the things that you've done, the stands that you've taken. You're making a difference. It may not seem like it, but the game is not over. The game is not over. God's not finished with that. So I have a great confidence in what you have done. But I have an even greater confidence in what you can do that's still out there. Now, now I'm going to tell you, somebody listen to me very carefully. Some of you, when I say that, I'm going to tell you, you may not even think this in the exact words, but you're Attitude is, he doesn't realize, he doesn't realize all that I've had to go through and how difficult this is or how long it's been, how tough it's been. He doesn't realize. You're right, I don't. But you think, you think God missed out on that? You think God lost sight of that? I don't think so. I know that's not the case. And so we see that and we see what the Lord, what the Lord is. So there's a confidence in what you can do. So having said that, look at what we got here. We have a, a book that God gave to us that we've studied that's one of the primary sources of leadership in the world. You're not going to find anything of size that's any, that's any better at this. And God has given to us opportunity. The only question, the only question is, are we going to apply it? It's all about application in our lives, taking a movement and being active in what that is. It is easy for us to do that. Very, very simple for us to skip past that. So, because of the confidence, I mean, I, I just have, I have a confidence in you, when I look around and see all that can be done, we are, we're kind of overwhelmed because how can we make a difference? And I, I, and I look around today, I look around today and I could just, I could just walk around here and just point, point, spend the rest of the time and a couple hours more just walking around and looking at what you have done and looking at what you can do in the name of the Lord. But for all of us, we've been in Nehemiah, what can we take out of this? Now, we've learned a lot. If you've been here, we've seen a lot of it. But what can you do? And I want to give you quickly, quickly, I mean just boom, boom, boom. And if you've got your outline, 12 principles. 12 principles. I just went back and went over the book of Nehemiah. 12 principles. This wouldn't be all of them, okay? But, but I looked at them. And saw these 12, and I wouldn't want to put them there. Um, they're, they're think, all these things are true for you, and they are, they are applicable for you right now. Number one, the Lord wants to use you. That's what happened in Nehemiah chapter 1. In verse 6, the, the calling of the Lord was on him. Nehemiah heard about Jerusalem. God broke his heart. The Lord wants to use you. Let me tell you something. There were literally thousands of people that were in captivity, literally all over that part of the world that probably had more ability for, than Nehemiah, but God picked him. God picked him. And in some situations, God has picked you. The Lord wants to use you. Now, we need to be available to him, and this is where, number two, the power of prayer. We see that in, in Nehemiah that he became a person of prayer. Nehemiah is a great book of prayer. You may not uh, see that when you read it, but it is. It is a great book of prayer because we see what happens, how he cried out to God. He said, oh, Lord, I beseech you, O Lord God of heaven, the great and awesome, this is verse 5 of chapter 1, awesome God who preserves the covenant and loving kindness for those who love him and keep his commandments. That's just applicable for you as it is for him. To know the power of prayer. Do not walk out of here and try to do it by yourself. 
That doesn't work. If you do that, you're going to get the same result that you've always gotten, which is always going to be frustrating. You need to look at the power of prayer in your life. It gets very practical. You just have to let him get close to you. Thirdly, you've got to say God gives you a vision. Now, for, for some, it's a little vision. This is a vision that what could happen in the life of a person or a neighbor. A person, what could happen in the life of a coworker? What could happen in the life of someone that you know and love that is dealing with addiction? What could happen in the life of a, of, of a child or, 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 a, or a grandchild? What could happen in the life of, a, of someone that you, that, you, that you work with? Any, anyone. God gives you that. And God gives you a vision. Now, listen. Folks, um, I probably have, I, I never made a list. I should have. I should have made a list of of visions, I think, that the Lord has given me. But many times it was just off-the-wall ideas that I have. They would be in the hundreds, probably in the thousands of very little things and very good big things and say, Lord, what is it that you would have me to do? What is it that you would have me to do? God gives you an opportunity in the midst of a conversation. Sometimes it's just to connect somebody here with somebody here. But the vision is important. That's what happens here. That's what, that's what happened in, in chapter 2. You look at over there, verse 17. This is one of my favorite verses. Because the people didn't know what to do. But God gave Nehemiah a vision. And he said, then I said to them, verse 17, you see the bad situation that we're in Jerusalem? Or that Jerusalem is desolate and its gates burned by fire. Come, let us rebuild the wall of Jerusalem so that we will no longer be a reproach. That wall was built because Nehemiah had the vision. Nehemiah had the vision and he would not quit. Listen, let me tell you something. Here's what what I know and believe. This is the intensity. It's a miracle of God. In fact, this is one of the things. He did it in 52 days. We cannot imagine that happening. We can't imagine that being done. And so therefore, when we think of situations that have been tough in our life, maybe it's something in your marriage, maybe it's something in your family, maybe it's a a, a problem with uh, something you've had a long time. You can't imagine getting that done in 52 days. Here's what I believe. I'm telling you, I believe with all of my heart, if they'd taken it, Nehemiah would have stayed 52 years because God gave him a vision. God gave him a vision and he would not quit. He would not quit. And we're going to see that more in just a moment as well. When you have that vision, God is going to give you a plan. God gave him that plan. That plan was to rebuild those walls. And after he rebuilt those walls, then they, the temple had already been rebuilt, and they came back to the Word of God. It changed all of history right there because he followed the plan. I have said, and I would say, tell you right now, there are things in my life that I don't know what to do. I don't know what to do. That's what I'd say. I don't know if that's the truth. I can always do something. I can always do something. I I just, and I know that God has a plan. I just may not be willing to take the next step. You know what the next step is. Maybe a hard step. Maybe a little higher than another one. But you've got to take the next step. You, what you have to do is you have to, along with the rest of us, follow a plan. As you follow that plan, pray for discernment. Pray that God gives you vision and God gives you a plan and he gives you a discernment to figure it out. Lord, help me to see what I should do here. Here's a place where I need to speak very clearly and here's another place where I don't need to do that. And I need to do, pray for discernment. Sixthly, what happened to him, and you'll see it in chapter four, stay focused. Stay focused. We have to keep our eyes on him. When I say that, stay focused on him. Stay 
focused. That's what needs to happen in your life, my life. Lord, what would you have me to do? It's easy for me to get focused on something else. The, the seventh one is so important because we live in a world of quitters. Don't quit. Refuse to quit. It may go slow. It may be only a little bit, but you don't quit. You just, you just keep going. You will not quit. Nehemiah had a hundred. He could, he could have quit because of money. He could have quit because of fear. He could, could have quit because he didn't have the labor. He could have quit because he had been threatened. He could have quit because of his enemies. He could, have, he could have quit because the people wouldn't pay attention to him. He could have quit because he was threatened. There's there, God, just reason after reason after reason. Nehemiah could have said, quit. Think nobody ever tried before? Think nobody ever had the idea to rebuild the walls before? Yeah, they had the idea. They just wouldn't quit. By the way, quitting means that you don't quit on the idea. But folks, let me tell you something refusing to quit means. You got somebody in your life that you don't need to quit on. By that, I mean, as you minister to them, maybe you've done all you can, just, you just pray for them. I've seen that, and I see it numerous times every week, just to pray for them. God is still in the miracle business in people's lives. We don't see it automatic. It's certainly not like a vending machine, but God is still in the business of changing people's lives. And when I say that, I'll have to tell you, sometimes I have an attitude of hopelessness. I, I don't, I, I say that, I say that, and before God, I, I, I will tell you, there, there, there are some things where I just, I know, I know that's true, but the battle for me is that one of just, boy, I've tried, Lord, and it's just, I don't have any hope that's there. Refuse to quit. Number eight, keep your eyes on the Lord rather than circumstances. In chapter five, you'll see a story there. And we, and we uh, looked at it in verse five, verse 18, uh, of where he came together and he, uh, not came together, but where he came and just would not give up on the Lord. God had given him direction. He, he would not quit. You see this over and over. He, he would not quit and he stayed focused on him. Lord, if I, if I lose hope here, then what I need to do is I need to keep my eyes on you. We have a society that tells us to look at everything else. They tell us to look at our circumstances, look at our money, look at our own security, look at our uh, family, look at everything about us. And what we need to do is we need to keep our eyes focused on him. Lord, what would you have me to do? Even when nobody else is paying attention to you, what we need to do is we need to focus on him. We need to live courageously. It is somewhat lonely. Nehemiah, when he went there, he didn't know anybody. The king had given him the opportunity to be governor. He didn't know anybody. And he kept his eyes on the Lord and he lived courageously. These enemies came against him and said, come on, meet with us, Nehemiah. They were going to kill him. They want to assassinate him. He said, man, I'm not coming off this wall, baby. I'm not giving up a great work of God to come meet with you. I'm not going to run because you tell me to run. They made all types of threats against him, and he lived courageously. Hey, folks, listen, you don't have to be in a fight to live courageously, all right? Sometimes it takes courage to be a prayer warrior. Sometimes it takes courage, or all the time, to forgive. It takes courage to seek understanding. We need to live, as the, as the Scripture tells us there, to live courageously. We need to encourage those around us. Now, this is so important. You see, I've got, I've got confidence in you. Not only in when you do what God would have you to do, then let me tell you, he's going to give you the ability to encourage someone else. That's what he did. Nehemiah didn't build those walls. Now, I'm going to tell you something. I believe this. 
I believe if those people had rebelled against him, I think Nehemiah would have gotten a pick and a shovel and a wheelbarrow and gone out there and worked on himself until he dropped dead. But God gave him the ability to encourage other people around him. Which brings me to the, to the next to the last one. We need to practice determination. You know, this goes, we, we have to see this. I guess this is looking away, no, the quitting. But it's not. Refusing to quit is taking the negative out of your life. Determination is a positive thing. <laughs> Refusing to quit is saying, I will not look back. Determination is saying, I'm going to keep looking forward. I'm going to keep looking forward to what God has for me. And the bottom line is, the last one is, I want to glorify the Lord. Now, folks, let me tell you something. You don't have to be a Hebrew scholar. You don't have to be a biblical scholar. You don't, you don't have to be uh, someone who's had 14 years in leadership training. You take those principles right there, all of them are right there that we've studied, every one of them in the book of Nehemiah. If you do that, it's going to make you better. It's going to make you, uh, it's going to give you greater strength. And it's going to make us less verb, give us less verbiage. We're going to talk about it. We talk about doing things, talk about opinions. It means that we can make the tough decisions. And to make the tough decisions, we need to make the right decisions. We make the, make the decisions a priority. First decision means to be what, what, um, what happens in our spiritual lives. Nehemiah is an Old Testament book. But you see, this is a book that once again points to the New Testament. When we serve the living Lord Jesus, when you say and are willing to acknowledge no pride, no putting on airs, no putting up an image, when you say, listen, here's where I am and I've got a lot of things happening in my life. I know I'm a sinner and I know that God sent his son to die on the cross for my sin and I'm going to confess my sin, turn from my sin. I'm going to give my heart to the Lord Jesus because I love my family, because I love the life that God has given me, because I want to make a difference, because I don't want to just sit on the sidelines. Christ gives you the opportunity to make a difference. And the grace of God, the power of God, is so overwhelming. And you're sitting, and the devil has said to you, you can't do this, you can't do this, you can't do this. You can't do this. Yes, you can. Not because you have the ability. God will give you the ability you need, but because you know the living God. Do you know Jesus as your Savior? First of all, you must have to say unquestionably, you've given your heart to Christ. And God puts you in the church of Jesus Christ to make a difference, which so many of you do. But we can do so much more in everything we have. Our time, our talents, our resources, everything belongs to him. What we need to do is make those decisions to be that leader. That's what God would have you to do today. Every single one of you can do this. When I... When I Walked in here, and one of the reasons I did this, I just felt like up here, I'm just so far. I mean, I could, I could just walk around. I could sit down and say this same thing, and probably take a little bit more time for, the, for me to do the whole thing individually. But I'm going to tell you, the truth wouldn't be any different. For every single one of us, it's there. It means there's a constant development of growth. We grow as believers. We go as a part of the church family. You need a church home, we open the doors of this church. There are opportunities for you to serve. I said to someone this week, hey, folks, there are more opportunities to serve than you can count in the family of God. Would you do what God would have you to do?